Thanks for joining us today. This is one of those win-win uh, 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 kind of events. We, it's good, as you know, we're, we're pleased to be able to uh, host a number of speakers, workshops, and conferences, and the like. And often they're they're interdisciplinary, and, and they're about big ideas, or they're about the next field in the national security, or about some ongoing crisis. But this one is uh, really for the lawyers. And it's, uh, it's very uh, down in the weeds in one respect and very pragmatic in another. We're going to talk to you, with you about what the field is in national security lawyers, what national security lawyers do, what the practice is like, where the jobs are. And there's, uh, there's no better way to do that than to have two of the most respected and uh, senior national security lawyers in the business joined by a client. Of the, of the national security law community. You all, many of you, or most all of you, probably know Admiral Bob Moret, who's now in his third year here as the Deputy Director of Inscot and Professor of Practice in the PAIA Department at the Maxwell School. And you also know that Admiral Moret was uh, Director of the National Geospatial Agency before he joined us, one of the agencies of the United States Intelligence Community, and before that, a long distinguished career. Uh, in the United States Navy, uh, including as Director of Naval Intelligence. Our two guests from outside today, I'm going to introduce them very briefly because part of their uh, charge is to, is to talk about their, their career. So on, on Bob's immediate right is Colonel Rich Whitaker. Rich is a retired uh, staff judge advocate in the United States Army. He was uh, there most recently signed the Court of Criminal Appeals and Special Operations Command. He's currently the Director of Sensitive Activities Oversight for the United States Special Operations Command. That's about the uh, During his military career, uh, Rich was also a professor of law at the, uh, at the Operational Law Department of the JAG School in Charlottesville. Uh, and there was involved in various activities related to operational law that I'll uh, ask him to describe later. To the right of Colonel Whitaker is George Jameson, who's uh, a, a principal now in his uh, own consulting firm, uh, Jameson Consulting, that advises corporate and government clients on national and international security matters. Uh, he's also a, a widely respected <clears throat> attorney, author, and lecturer on many national security related issues. George and I are uh, co-members of, of the ABA Standing Committee on Law and National Security, in which we've worked on some cooperative projects in, in recent years. Uh, George, like me, started at the CIA when I was very young. He was very young. He had a 33-year career in the General Counsel's Office of the CIA. You started when you were 11, as I did, then. <laughs> I believe we'd be about 45, 46 now. So that's right. Uh, and I'm going to stop there with George. Uh, Rich, would you get the conversation started? Let me just briefly kind of give you an overture because you may be more familiar with a, uh, somebody who works as a, within the general counsel's office or is, serves as the general counsel in, in one of our national agencies than you are the, the, the military JAG force. So, just very briefly, and of course this is a, a paid advertisement for the Service JAG Force, uh, which I, where I spent nearly 30 years. Uh, now, at the very beginning of your career, so if you were, one of you were to graduate from law school and enter the JAG Force, you would, you would very quickly go into up to Charlottesville, Virginia, where the JAG School is co-located with the University of Virginia Law School, and be the beneficiary of the Kimmon course there. Some of it, most of it is actually spending the JAG, uh, the JAG School there giving you an injection of everything you need to know to survive your first 90 days, frankly. Uh, military law, uh, national security law, physical law, things like that, and then, and then a heavy dose of what you might suspect criminal law, because you're going to be a prosecutor or a defense counsel uh, if you're lucky, and that's a, a whole lot of fun. And that's exactly what I did for my first seven years. I was a, I was a prosecutor. And then, at, at about the seven-year mark, what happens, is they uh, grab you out of wherever you are currently living and working and bring you back to Charlottesville and you and, and make you beneficiary of, a, of an LLM program. And you can choose whatever you want. I chose international law. And that, as a result of that, I made a sharp turn in my career and I started practicing international and intelligence law at that juncture. 
And then I, you know, I went on and I was a, a staff judge advocate, which is essentially a general counsel of large organizations, somewhere between 30 and say 75 or 100,000 personnel, and uh, which is like kind of being a, uh, a uh, city attorney for a medium and large size city. And then also, and then also the operational aspect of the military organization, whether it's First Cavalry Division or 101st Airborne Division, or et cetera, where, where you're providing uh, legal advice. So maybe sometimes on the battlefield, sometimes just back in the air. So, uh, then after that, I was I was the uh, the SCA, the 101st Airborne Division. I was Petraeus's lawyer for for three years, and concluded his, his first uh, tour in Iraq, just the second time around. But I came back from there, I went to the Army uh, uh, War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and then I went to SOCOM, United States Special Operations Command. Many of you probably heard that name, it's in uh, uh, games, etc. You know, it's popular media, very frequently, you're SOCOM. Uh, you probably know more, as much about it now as I did then, about eight, nine years ago, when I went there. I was, uh, for the most part, a conventional attorney. And I, and, I, and I worked in conventional activities and operations, which means I saw most things as black or white. It is, it is either authorized and legal, or it is not. It is either authorized and it has some restrictions attached to it, which are expressed in the law, or it does not. And also, I went with a fair degree of arrogance that I've been doing this for a long time at that juncture, about 23 or four years, and there's not much you can tell me about operational law international law or intelligence law. That was my going to position. In fact, I think I said that a couple of times in my first week, couple of weeks. <laughs> and uh, very quickly, I learned that I didn't know a lot. And, and I also realized that the terrain, the legal terrain, was shifting under my feet. And so I very quickly saw shades of gray everywhere in SOCOM. And uh, so what, what happened after that, and I think what many of you may have read about or seen, uh, you know, a, a lot of congressional reporting, a lot of collection uh, efforts that occurred, a lot of activities that occur on, on operational landscapes around the world. SOCOM has got assets in more than 80 countries. Uh, it's a very, very large enterprise. And uh, the legal issues range from the, uh, frankly, boring to more excitement than, than you really want uh, on, the other, on the other end of that spectrum. I always call it the good thing, bad thing spectrum. You want to stay toward the good, but very frequently you find yourself toward the back. And uh, you're trying to work your client away from that end of the spectrum, doing everything you can to protect your client. And, and I just want to throw one more thing out there before I yield here in my <clears throat> first piece. You know, typically, the first question uh, that commanders like, for example, Petraeus would ask is, um, is, is this an activity? And you're, you as the lawyer, the senior lawyer in an organization will be standing right there when, when this question, or it doesn't really matter it's a military organization, think any organization, you as a lawyer typically would be standing you know, where this question is asked. Is this something we want to do? In a military organization, is this an operational act or task that we want to, that we want to perform? So will this make the, us stronger or the enemy weaker? Will this give us some type of tactical or operational or strategic advantage? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then you move to the second question, and that's when they turn toward you, the lawyer, and say, is this legal? Is there legal authority to do this? And if it is legal, what are the restrictions that might be expressed in the law that will kind of curb where we go to the left or to the right? And then finally, they'll ask, okay, if we can do this, and your answer, my answer almost always, I can find a way to do almost everything. I can find a way to protect you and do this as long as you don't do X, Y, and Z or A, B, and C. Go down the middle, I can, I can find a way may not be the way you thought you were going to get there, but I can get you from point A to point B legally and protect you. So the next question is, is this something we want to do? And then that's when the policy considerations, which is kind of what I do now, uh, we consider the second third order effects of doing it. Is this something, even though legally we could do it, do we want to do it? And frankly, uh, I think what many of you might be surprised by is the client typically is the smartest guy in the room. And the client typically says, okay, I understand that, that there's a reason to do this. I understand that, that it's legally available to us to do this. I'm not so sure that and sometimes as a lawyer, you get kind of pulled into it and become kind of a cheerleader supporting, supporting whatever it is. Uh, and it's important for the client to be who they are, at least in our national uh, 
security apparatus that are using pre smart phones. And so I'm not so sure I want to do this, and then they start peppering your questions. You may not do you may not do it, and the reason you may not do it is because the client deals with this. George, how's your experience uh, alike or, or different from Colonel Whitaker's? Little, little both. Um, let, me, let me tell you how I got to the CIA and what I did as an attorney there. I got out of law school in 1975, and that was when the Church Committee, the Rockefeller Commission, the Pike Committee had all been investigating intelligence activities. Uh, I uh, ended up in Washington because as a third year, uh, I was trying to figure out where I would go. My wife and I were both from Boston, and we decided we weren't quite ready to go back and have Sunday dinner with the folks every Sunday. So I uh, uh, told the people I was supposed to go work for, uh, I wasn't going, and my wife and I decided that we would go wherever the first job came up. She got a job teaching in Falls Church outside of Washington, so that's where we went. And one night, uh, as we had a longtime family friend over for dinner, over dessert, she said, you know, I'm really CIA. This is somebody who's been a family friend for years. Would you be interested in working for CIA? So I said, do they have lawyers? You read in the newspaper, you want it, but I am And so I thought, well, I'll talk to anybody. And uh, never turned down a job you haven't been offered. So I interviewed and, and uh, was, uh, because of the time, the first lawyer hired directly out of law school at CIA General Counsel's office. There were about 15 lawyers in the office. The lawyer had, the, the office had started with three lawyers for 10 years, and uh, for years they had fewer than 10 lawyers. And anyway, I, I came in on the, uh, just as the investigations were ending, and we, the, the CIA, had to figure out what now. Um, and everything was not black and white. Everything was great. Uh, the, uh, the tone at the time was, CIA is bad, CIA must do less, we have to uh, restrict its activities, we need more oversight, we need uh, more restrictions. And as a young lawyer, right out of law school, I and, and my other colleagues, many of whom were also new to CIA, because of the recommendations that CIA bring in outsiders who weren't caught up in the culture and the operational fervor of CIA. We're looking at activities as if we're outsiders to a great extent. So everything was, uh, what's, what's the Constitution? What are the statutes? And there were not a lot of statutes. A lot of this was people making things up as we went along because CIA statutory authority included a provision that said CIA may expend funds for purposes necessary to carry out its functions, notwithstanding any other provision of law. What does that mean? Well, in, in the decades previously, in the fight against communism, that meant you're dealing with uh, targeting foreigners. You can pretty much do anything. Uh, no, no real restrictions, although as a policy matter, the general counsel, who was there from OSS days, and Lawrence Houston was the general counsel from 1947 until 1973, actually took a fairly conservative approach towards the exercise of those authorities. So we tended to look at things, on the, as one uh, subsequent general counsel said, lawyers have many hands. It's always on the one hand, on the other hand. And we were probably viewed, I know we were viewed somewhat skeptically by the operations folks who were used to just doing anything they wanted <coughs> without talking to lawyers. Um, uh, you know, before I forget, I have to go back to the age uh, issue. Uh, I, I really was. I you know, took a year off between college and law school. I was pretty young, but I'm reminded of that wonderful line from The Importance of Being Earnest. And as, as lawyers, you will all realize one of the things you have to do is read more than just the law. You learn a lot about how to be a lawyer by reading more than just the law. Maybe not from what I'm about to say, but 
The wonderful line was, ah yes, 29, a wonderful age. I was 29 for many years once I turned 30. <laughs> anyway, as an aside. So as a young lawyer, uh, we were thrown, I was thrown into one of only four units. The office just reorganized. We did everything. We did uh, legal policy, we looked at constitution, statutes, legislation, uh, ethics, uh, copyright, uh, soup to nuts. Uh, and, and over the course of my career, and I should say, I went, I went in thinking I was there for two years. And then I was going to go back to Boston and get on with whatever I was going to get on. Thirty-three years later, I retired which tells you I, I must have either been having a lot of fun or simply couldn't get a job anywhere else. And I like to think it was the former, not the latter. Over the course of my career, I did the general stuff, where you learn the nuts and bolts. The practice of national security law at CIA is a combination of the sexy and the nuts and bolts. The nuts and bolts are, how do you spend money? What do you do if you want to fire an employee? when the director of central intelligence may terminate someone in his absolute discretion, uh, notwithstanding any other provision of law. Um, how, how, do you, how do you handle that? How do you follow the normal government rules, but use your special authorities when it, we think it's appropriate to do so, typically for operational or sensitive security matters? My personal career took me from that general approach dealing quite a bit with intelligence community-wide matters, which meant not just the CIA activities, which included human collection and technical collection, but the activities of NSA and DIA and the National Reconnaissance Office, and the management, the legal issues relating to the management of those activities. Without going into great detail, at this time I became, over time, the lawyer for the operations director at the DO, now the clandestine service, where you have to deal with COVID, corporate action questions, terrorism, and Congress, and congressional oversight. You have to explain why <coughs> if somebody gets killed in an operation, uh, uh, somebody on the other side gets killed in one of your operations, it's not an assassination. It, it might be self-defense. Uh, you're not targeting that individual for a political killing. Self-defense is not assassination. Assassination is political killing. Those are the types of issues we dealt with. I was the lawyer for the Counterintelligence Center at one point where we dealt with national policy-wide issues in dealing with the FBI and the new jurisdictions and responsibilities that the FBI was getting in a period of transition after 1986, the year of the spy, when the tremendous scandals were spying against the U.S. I was the uh, lawyer for the intelligence director, the analysts, where uh, at the time people said, what, what, why did you be the lawyer for the intelligence director? What did they do? Well, what they didn't do was know anything about how to deal with U.S. person information. And they needed legal help so that they would properly <coughs> handle information and not respond improperly when they were briefing members of Congress or other executive branch officials who would say, well, you've told me this information in general about some company operating overseas. Tell me about the individuals. And their answer has to be, you really shouldn't know who those people are. That's not important to the intelligence. If it's important to understanding the intelligence, we will tell you. But we want to balance those privacy interests and not tell you the names of those individuals. I was, uh, and the other reason that uh, working as a lawyer for the DI was exciting was I worked war crimes. We supported the State Department and the administration in the 90s in the uh, prosecutions and the building of the cases for the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal. And I also worked to support the State Department in developing the, uh, the rules for the International Criminal Court. So you get soup to nuts, you get policy, you get the operational detail. Um, I headed the litigation division uh, for a number of years where you get to protect secrets. That's largely the litigation that CIA gets involved in is protecting intelligence sources and methods. Um, FOIA cases, criminal cases where a defendant seeks discovery, third party litigation, 
that they, where they're just fishing. The other thing about CIA's general counsel's office, and to a great extent this is typical of the general counsel's offices around the community, uh, is that you get to move around outside of the CIA. So I had rotational assignments once to the U.S. Attorney's Office for uh, nine or ten months, U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., where I handled civil litigation, got to stand up in front of a judge, learn how to bring my calendar with me wherever I went. Uh, and I do that to this day, and I made an exception for this trip because I didn't want to carry my paper calendar, so I'm only using my smartphone. But you carry that calendar everywhere because when you're in front of a judge, and the judge says, are you free on this Tuesday, you need to say yes. Or no, you can't say, Judge, I'll get back to you. That's all part of the practice. I also got a White, a White House uh, counsel's rotational. I, I worked ethics issues uh, in the White House and uh, very briefly. And then uh, also got a rotation to the Inspector General's office where I worked on an inspection uh, uh, helping them look at the cover. How, how does CIA handle cover? Is it good? handled well, handled poorly, and so on. So that is that is uh, my Office of General Counsel career. Uh, but because you get to move around, I went on to Congressional Affairs. I was the deputy in the <coughs> office and had the uh, good fortune or misfortune, perhaps, to be involved in uh, an intelligence community reform. I was the point for handling that. Then got asked to go down to the DNI's office set up their legislative office, set up their legislation division in the general counsel's office before going back to the CIA. And I mention those because as a lawyer, you're often called upon to do jobs that are not in a general counsel's office. We have we have a lot of opportunities to take other assignments. The, the, uh, in fact, the current inspector general at NGA, who uh, <coughs> Professor Moret knows all about, used to be a CIA deputy general counsel. After leaving the general counsel's office, she went to become the director of finance. Uh, you get to do a lot of things where your legal skills are useful. They're very important. You have a sense of right and wrong in, in the building. You have a sense of how to get things done. You know how to analyze problems. Law school, you know, people say, well, I don't come out of law school with any specialty. You come out of law school knowing how to think. You come out of law school knowing how to analyze. Uh, you come out of law school, I hope, knowing how to write. Um, maybe not so much. Uh, but but that's those are the skills you use. Those are the skills you use in the general counsel's office. But then the, the leadership of an agency uh, will call upon you. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later about who's the client and how that operates. Uh, but my last job, I will, I will stop, uh, is, is that uh, when I came back from the DNI's office, um, having worked on the bill, having uh, uh, seen the uh, startup of the DNI's office, I went back to CIA, and as I said to the class this morning, when they asked me what I wanted to do, I said, I want to help CIA quit whining and get on with it, and, and uh, set up and ran the policy office for my last several years where we dealt with the DNI, we dealt with the NSC staff, we dealt with the Hill, we dealt with the policy matters. And um, uh, then I retired in, in 2009. So uh, I'm happy to uh, take questions, and Professor uh, Banks may have questions they'd like to steer us to about specifics on the practice of law, how we practice it, where we practice it, who's the client, and some of the challenges. But that that's a, a snapshot of my career. Let's spend just a minute before I think the, the students have a lot of questions and we should get right to them. Maybe a minute for both of you, though, on your relationship to the client. Since you've got a client here uh, at the table with us, what's the, what's the uh, dynamic like between the lawyer in national security and, and the client, and what kind of relationship do you have? I think uh, there's no way I, I could express the importance of that relationship. And obviously, it's all about who that person is and the, your understanding as a lawyer of the organization. And frankly, that human being that's your client 
They're all different because they're human beings. Um, they're, you know, any type of national security construct, they're going to be incredibly ambitious and smart. Uh, I think that there are also going to be people that, that put their feet on the side of the bed this morning with the intent of going forward and doing the right thing. Um, and, and, and they're also going to be uh, almost, without a single exception, patriots. Uh, so those, that's the kind of person that, that 99 out of 100 times, I think, I never ran into anybody that wasn't like that. Um, so if they go back to the, the, the organization uh, and to go back to something else that my the colleague on my right said, uh, reading something other than the law, I think it's important for, for lawyers to research the history of the organization, uh, to go in with a deep appreciation and understanding of the historical fabric uh, that the organization that surrounds the organization, uh, because your clients going to know that, and, and they they possess a degree of ownership for the organization, whether it's CIA, SOCOM, the Navy, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, those are all, you know, uh, story organizations that have done great things for the nation, and, and a lot of great people have worked for them. So. Uh, it's really important for you as a lawyer to, to have an appreciation and knowledge of that. Then you can work that into your dialogue with your client. Uh, you're going to start winning the, 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 the client over. The, the client is looking to you, and he, he wants you to be all those things you, that each of you might imagine that he wants you to be. He wants you to have an absolute grasp on the law that applies. Uh, he doesn't want you to be you know, kind of, again, like the guy that says, well, I'll get back to you. Uh, you're going to win them over by knowing the answer. Of course, if you don't, you should say, I'll get back to you. you, should you? Um, because they'll, they'll see that immediately. And you shouldn't do that anyway. Uh, so the, 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 the expectation is that you're a very, very broad, very hard worker, uh, that you've done your homework, you understand the law, you understand the organization, and you understand the mission. You understand whatever it is that that organization is mission uh, to accomplish. And uh, so if you walk into the room understanding that at least that's the expectation and that you've done what you can. And sometimes you may, you may arrive in, in an organization where you're opportunity to do all of that and to study all that, to become the, the, uh, the student of that history. You, know, if you're not, you may not have the opportunity to do as much as you want to do. But you should at least know that, that that's kind of the goal. If you walk in, you meet your client, and, uh, and you're trying to, frankly, showcase that just a bit to gain the confidence of the client. Uh, and then, uh, honesty, directness, no bullshit, no beating around the bush uh, with the client. Now, I always went in, basically, I, I, I tried to always know exactly what I thought the client was trying to get, where he was trying to get. Uh, whether it was, a, uh, it was a, a criminal prosecution, I'd walk in and lay out the case to the convening authority who it usually is, it was a full colonel or, or a general officer, flag officer. And I would lay out all the pros and the cons and uh, make a recommendation. Uh, you know, just like that, like it's a business plan. And, uh, and explain and be prepared to ask, you know, to respond to what I thought would be the, the probable questions that that client might ask. And of course, if you're not, you haven't really kind of thought it through. And uh, again, that kind of shakes the confidence. So again, uh, I can tell you that every single client I had, uh, you know, in a military organization, you'll have a lot of clients. It's not just the guy that's running the organization. It's all the subordinate officers and, and leaders, et cetera. And um, so, and then it's your, your colleagues, so you know, that, that are not lawyers, but the members of the staff that you're working with, you're just trying to set them all up for success. And those are the guys you're calling about. They're calling you by your first name, calling them by their first name. You're going out, you're socializing with them. Um, and they're also feeding you information about the senior guy that can set you up to be a better lawyer, provide better legal advice, and, and help the organization move to get in a new uh, direction. Let's make with you, George. Yeah, perhaps a few different, uh, generally, yes. Let me uh, approach it slightly differently. Uh, partly, I think, because of how CIA's general counsel's office grew and developed. Uh, almost from the beginning, for me and my contemporaries, the question was, who's the client? Uh, the 
the CIA General Counsel's Office has a centralized approach to doing business. Uh, the, the General Counsel is responsible for all the lawyers in a very real way, direct chain of command. Uh, even if the lawyers are increasingly offing components and the lawyers for the DO or the DI or somebody else in the building. So there are multiple clients. There's the immediate customer, the immediate unit manager. If you're a lawyer assigned to the counterterrorism center, there's the head of the counterterrorism. He's a client. But the counterterrorism center is part of the operations directorate, so the head of what is the chain of command, they're all clients. And the, the big question was, is it the immediate operational customer who's the client, or is it the agency head, the director of central intelligence, who's the client, or is it the agency, regardless of what the agency head wants to do, is there some greater good if the head of the agency is, in fact, off on, on a tangent or on a lark. Uh, for CIA, the question always was, is it the president and the NSC? Particularly when you're dealing with covert action and, and you're part of the executive branch. And then ultimately, uh, and, and this may sound quaint to some extent, but back in 1976, 70s is it the American people. And, uh, you know, Congress always says they're the client, they're the other branch of government, they're not the client. Um, uh, but, but it was always kind of, well, it's the guy standing in your doorway says, I want to know the answer because I want to do this. And that's, yeah, yeah, in one sense it's a client. So what resonates is you want to, you want to get whoever walks through the door to understand you're there to help. And uh, you're not looking just to put up obstacles. You want to point out impediments. You want to find ways to help the client get what ought to be done. And it isn't always what the client is asking. You have to understand what's really at stake and what are you really trying to accomplish. And to do that and do it effectively, you have to be discreet. Because nobody wants to come in to your office uh, any more than they do in the private practice and think that you're going to go running out and telling everybody what he wants to do if he's got a stupid idea uh, or even a good idea. Uh, you have to have a trust relationship. There has to be, whether it's with a component chief, uh, the head of the director, or the director. director of CIA, and almost universally, they would talk about having that rapport and trust relationship, where when you walk in and say, you can't do X, or you can do X, but uh, you need them, and they want to be able to simply rely upon what you're saying. They don't want to second guess, and they won't second guess your legal judgment, at least not very often. They may question you, they may challenge you, they may hold your feet to the fire when you really have to justify it. And, and for a CIA lawyer who's a component lawyer, I'll tell this, uh, it, it, it can be a fine line because early on where they were not used to dealing with lawyers, they didn't like hearing no, they didn't even want to come to you. So you had to build up the trust, you had to show them that you were there to help. You weren't just there as an extension of the Inspector General or the investigating arm of Congress to report them that they were doing something wrong. wrong. But they also knew that if they were doing something illegal, you were going to have to report them. And so how you work that relationship really, really became very important. And, and it wasn't a question of saying, there's some things I don't want to know, don't tell me. Uh, you, you, what I found was that, uh, surprisingly, the so-called secretive, uh, untrustworthy operations guys were very forthcoming. They'd walk into your office and spill their guts, full well knowing that you were going to have to turn them in if they did something illegal. 
And, and so, not just the lawyers, but organizationally, I think everybody understood that at one level it was the institution that was the client, and you do what's important for the institution as part of the broader uh, basis. And, and the balance that I mentioned was that I, I actually had an operations deputy director for DDO, head of clandestine service at the time, uh, have a proposal that I was working on that he said was not ready for prime time. And would I please not tell the general counsel? Which raises a real interesting challenge because my boss is the general counsel. And I said to my general counsel, he asked me, what's going on? I said, I can't tell you. And I told him why, and he said, okay. And so, you know, you work those, you build the trust relationship, uh, and, and as uh, you know, the says, you have to move a lot. You have to uh, go in with a confidence, and not just identify problems. As lawyers, whether it's an intelligence agency or anywhere else, whether you're a consultant or anybody else, they may say they want the the options, pros and cons. They want the answer. They don't want you to go in and say, I've got five problems I've just identified for you. They don't want to know, what, what do I do? What's the answer? And one of the toughest things, I will stop with this, is how to <coughs> avoid telling them what to do. And it's a fine line between telling them options and giving a recommendation versus telling them what to do. You're the lawyer, you're not the policy officer who's, officer who's got to make the actual decision. And you want to be very careful to distinguish between the policy and the law. To distinguish, well, here's what I think you ought to do, but you can do these other things as well. And walking that line uh, with some people who are afraid of going to jail or afraid of getting in trouble, they really know, want to know what do I do and they, and they have to resist. Uh, in, in most cases, resist uh, telling them what to do because now you're the problem and you need to learn. Bob, maybe as a brief transition to the questions from the students, from a perspective of an agency head, what's the role of the council? How important is the lawyer in the organization? It's absolutely vital, and I think we've touched on most of the points already, but I'll just uh, amplify some of the things you've heard from Rich and George already. And Perspective of a client, which by the way sounds like a giant person, but the client, but also really as a partner of, of the people that work in the law through the operational and other assignments. But the first thing, the, the most important point I think, is to always have the general counsel or the JAG, depending upon their walk of life, or in the room for discussion. Now, every assignment that I had uh, through many years, I always had to. Um, Increase the amount of participation that exists by general counsel and JAG personnel in decision making processes, even the most mundane kind of meetings, you know, the personnel promotions at the mid grade level, for example, something like that, I use it as an example. You are always better off to have the general counsel and the judge advocate general representative in the room for any kind of decision making at all. If you, if you leave them out, you do so much wrong. As you've already heard, I mean, the array of things that you need, legal advice for us so is wider and deeper than most people anticipate. They tend to gravitate towards more dramatic kind of things, but operations, collections, and personnel, uh, promotions in particular, is something that uh, having you know, legal advice and legal oversight for any promotions you may be doing is absolutely essential, but also for misconduct, as uh, Rich mentioned earlier. One of the most important uh, roles for general counsel, personnel, and the intelligence community is acquisition and contracts. As you may have seen, the unclassified figure is about $55 billion. It's the annual budget for the intelligence community. Uh, some of that is personnel, some of it's overhead, but most of it is contracts. So you have legal oversight for even for some of the smaller elements of the intelligence community, billions of dollars in contracts. If that isn't pretty watertight from a legal standpoint, it can break down an organization very at NGA, just as a rough order of magnitude, you have high double figures of uh, uh, individuals in our office of general counsel, around 88 to 92, depending on that. Our engagements, roughly half of those dealt with acquisition contracts on the whole financial side of the business. Again, ones in the billions of dollars. 
I was speaking just uh, about the military for a second. Rich has told you most about that. But then as a client, but really as a partner, uh, rules of engagement are the purview of uh, individuals in the judge advocate general board. And that is very much an intersection of the intelligence business, really more as a partner than a client. And an example that I would give for that is targeting. That's one of the more dramatic things. But you know, the decisions that are made by operational commanders on targeting actually you have three people with key roles at the, uh, the table, an operations officer, intelligence officer, and the JAG. And typically leading up to any, op any kind of discussion <coughs> in terms of decision making, uh, the, the JAG and the intelligence officer spend a lot of time with each other trying to dovetail the recommendations because it's not the kind of thing we have, okay, this is the intelligence, and these are the rules of engagement implications because they are very, very fluid and very interactive mention that to you because for those of you that get into this field, a day in, day out interaction that Rich mentioned in terms of the first name basis on the other members of the staff, particularly for rules of engagement between uh, JAG personnel and intelligence personnel is uh, very broad and very deep and there's really no dividing line there in some respects because it's very, as I said, fluid and uh, interactive. Just two final points before we turn it over. Uh, I'd like to reiterate something that George said about lawyers who do not do JAG specific work. Uh, I worked with a very large number of individuals uh, uh, in my career who had uh, law degrees, who had passed bar exams, but were not, quote, practicing law, unquote. Including people who ran security, installations, personnel, international programs, policy, all of whom, in fact, the ambassador that I worked with overseas for three years is uh, also a but uh, all of them, they practice law every single day. Uh, they were not in you know, more traditional general counsel or judge advocate general roles. And I say that because for many of you uh, here in the law school may be aspiring to do things in government and national security field, you're not just restricted to the office of general counsel or the military or JAG anymore because there's a lot of other important things that you can do at the senior level. Just two final points. Uh, I thought the points that uh, George made in terms of the lawyers' network is very important. There's an expectation that you have a J Corps officer or a, a senior general counsel that they are going to stay engaged with their counterparts on a day in day out basis, primarily in the uh, fields that we come from in the uh, Department of Defense and the Office of uh, the Director of National Intelligence. And that network is, is actually very positive and encouraged and important. Uh, there's an anticipation that a general counsel senior level of the intelligence community uh, and the combat support agencies is in communication at least weekly and probably more often than with the general counsel of the Department of Defense and the uh, general counsel of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence on the common plans. That is encouraged and important. Just a final point, uh, there's different opinions on this, but my own belief relative to the legal field is I feel very strongly relative to intelligence is that it uh, needs to be a non-transactional um, approach to the relationship you have with decision makers. And I think we've seen good examples of that already. But that is to say that there's parallels in the intelligence field. But in terms of legal advice, you don't just provide the legal advice, put it across the table, and then withdraw from the conversation. You need to be part of the conversation, you need to have ownership of the outcome, you need to participate in the entire decision making process. And you may, you have to be selective, I think, in terms of both fields, in terms of when you weigh in on decisions as they're made. But you need to be part of the team, and you need to state the outcome. It's very important in the legal field, as it is in uh, other fields. That's great. A uh, lot of good material. And now, it's your turn. What questions you have? Let's start us off. Yes, sir. Uh, as, as anyone can imagine, I've been thinking of the legal issues ranging from contracts to covert action or extremely complex. Uh, from both the civilian and the military side, uh, are these issues resolved collectively as attorneys or they become a top down approach? Sounds like you both got something to say in response to that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, by collectively, I mean, I think you mean it's not just solved <coughs> by the lawyers and, and, and whoever that is, a single group of yes. potential client. Um, well, let's, let's, let's take acquisition and procurement or 
physical law, which are all kind of mixed together. And, 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 and that is a complex stew that is being cooked uh, typically. And you're going to have involved in, in that process. Uh, uh, there's, there's a couple of dynamics. One, you may have very, very sophisticated individuals. If you're in a place like SOCOM again, which has its own acquisition authority, and like most combatant commands, uh, it's almost like a service. It's almost like the Army or the Navy uh, in itself. Uh, and there is a dedicated staff of physical law experts, a separate dedicated staff of contract and procurement acquisition uh, experts. Uh, some, in fact, some of the very best in the United States government uh, work here. They're really spectacular. Okay, so it, it, typically, if there is a problem of that sort that we're working, and usually that, you know, there's, we want to acquire a certain type of thing, uh, or we we might want to use some, we have actually some extraordinary contracting authorities that the point that's the Department of Defense has. Uh, but to use those, you have to be ready to justify the use of those things. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of like magic bullets. It's kind of the underdog pill. You want to take the pill. But you only got so many pills. And yet, to take the pill, you got to explain it. And so people, you really <coughs> try to convert people, don't, don't use the pill. You know, wait until you really need it. And, uh, so, it, it, you know, what, no matter what the solution is, we, we can rely on the, this incredibly dedicated uh, uh, crew of, of experts to resolve it. And people generally, because of how good they are and how well they've worked with others, uh, to identify hurdles that be uh, either removed from the playing field or jumped over. Uh, it's, usually, it's, it's as far as it goes. So to answer your question, at least to that one dimension of it, uh, I think people that have confidence in their lawyers are typically, and, and they know that they, you know, in the past have led them to the right point 50 out of 50 times in a row. And then and 50 out of 50 times they've said, they, I've actually used this statement, look, I got not vision goggles on, I can actually see the hurdles when I'm running in the dark. I can remove the hurdles or run you around them. You can just run behind me, grab my jersey, and trust me. Just trust me. And uh, I'll get you to the other side of the field. Because I can see stuff you can't because of my legal training. And because I've actually read all this stuff and I know it. Uh, the problem is, is that when you've got a dedicated staff like that, that I think that, that people will allow them to solve a problem, you're done. What happens, however, when uh, this happened to me personally, when you're not a procurement and contract expert, take any year of the law, you're not X, uh, but your boss has said, we don't have one of those guys. And we need to sign, say, a $3 billion contract with some Turkish company to bring uh, hydroelectric power down from Turkey into northern Iraq. You're it. You're the best we got. You may not be a contract lawyer, you're the best we got. And uh, you've got to sign this contract. You've got to figure out how to do this. In that case, I would tell my client, look, you shouldn't have 100% confidence in me. I'm going to do the very best. I'm going to reach out to other people. I'm going to try to find the expertise and bring it in. But this is going to be more of a negotiated, you know, work effort to solve because I don't have the, the knowledge, and I know I know, to solve this by myself. I'm going to reach out and bring people in. So then it becomes the wider solution set. For so, you know, and I think if there's enough honesty where people don't just say, hey, yeah, I can do this by myself, and they really don't have that type of expertise. Yeah, pretty similar. I think a lot depends on the nature of the problem that comes in. There are some questions that come in where relatively clear cut, you just have to do the research and analysis of the law. But a lot of the problems are in the gray area. There are policy implications, there are political implications. Uh, and uh, the more you go, move from the clear cut to the broader range of problems, the more the decision making is collected. E even, even on the clear cut ones, facts, you, you've got to talk to experts or factual experts. Uh, you have to talk to people, operators and others, about options. Uh, and, and you take all that into account. But where really, and, and on the law, you clearly may have to get to some other people who are experts. Where it really becomes more of a collective decision making is where there are major, where, where, the, where the law is not clear and there are major policy issues. And 
different general counsels, different lawyers handled that in different ways. I, I used to think as a very young attorney that I could not understand how somebody could be brought from the outside with no experience as an intelligence or national security lawyer and be made the general counsel. I'm right out of law school and the first guy had been there for 30 something years and the next guy had been his deputy uh, and they brought in an outsider. How can an outsider possibly understand the intelligence business? Well, over time I, I realized the perspectives that an outsider brings are incredibly valuable. And that's, that's gets into that collective decision making. We had one general counsel, Stanley Sporkin, who had been the head of enforcement at, at the Securities and Exchange Commission. And, and uh, when he was asked at one point, well, how can you at the SEC have been so eager for openness and transparency, and now you're at CIA, you're in favor of secrecy, and his answer was, well, that was then, this is now. But, but his, his broader way of doing business was he used his law enforcement and SEC experience to bring in parallels and to draw in outside expertise and to begin to look at problems in different ways. So, for example, in the 80s, as we're looking at how do you deal with terrorism, he's thinking, well, I know we go after racketeers under RICO, criminal racketeers. There must be a parallel that we could use to go after terrorists. So it varies, and as you can imagine, the more complicated the issue, the more likely there are going to be collective decisions and judgments. Next. Mr. Jameson, uh, in your, right now, where, how do you see new attorneys entering the national security legal marketplace? Is it through direct hires? Is it from, after a few years at a credit firm? Uh, and do you see a lot of rotation in and out? Good, good question. Um, it's hard to get. It's hard to break in right out of law school. Uh, CIA and other agencies have recruitment programs where they bring in people for the summer, but the budget situations are tough. It is, it is really hard. There, let, let me let me say that there are a number of ways to have national security jobs. There's CIA. There's NGA, there's NSA. Um, they're not going to be any easier. There's the FBI, there's the Justice Department, either in the National Security Division or elsewhere. Uh, there's the OSD General Counsel's Office, Office of Secretary of Defense. Uh, there's also the private sector, where there's most people don't think of it in these terms, but just read the newspapers. If you're a lawyer at Verizon, you know we deal with national security issues these days, or Google or Microsoft. Uh, if you are working for Boeing or Lockheed, you're dealing with export control matters. So what I would say for somebody who's interested in national security issues, first, um, expand your horizons. Uh, don't be disappointed if it's difficult to go right in from law school. And don't wait till your third year before you start looking if you want to get hired by a government agency to work on national security matters because they've already made the hiring decisions. Think about the private sector. Think about corporate America uh, and the work that they do. They can give you some experience and expertise in an area that then enables you to get in through the back door. Similarly, um, depending upon what your, the range of your interests, uh, at CIA, we would hire people who had EEO experience, and and they would come into the general counsel's office because we needed an EEO expert, or and then and then they would come in and do other things as well, or litigators. Uh, one of, one of the uh, most valuable experiences I think for anybody looking for work in the intelligence community is to know how to litigate a case, uh, to know how to deal with problems. And in terms of preparation for that, if I have to, and I wrote this down, if I have to identify areas of law that somebody in law school should be thinking about, unquestionably constitutional law, criminal law and procedure, uh, administrative law. I, I'm not sure 
what Syracuse does here, but as a first year law student and we've been married, I got administrative law and nobody did that at the time. That was, if not the most valuable, one of the most valuable classes I ever took, you understand, government bureaucracies. International law is good. And the State Department certainly has a big legal advisor's office, and the Justice Department and the military do international law. And ethics, um, contract law to be sure, but you kind of learn that uh, as, as a government attorney. So not to be pessimistic, it's right now very, very difficult getting in right out of law school. But don't, don't hesitate to try. Double tap it for a sec. Yep. When I would, I would say don't count out um, the military or, or the Department of Defense. And I just, we just kind of describe the playing field in terms of the of the legal workplace. And I'm just going to use SOCOM as an example, but it would be the same where you go. I had 300 attorneys that worked for me at SOCOM, but only 100 of those were military attorneys, uniform wearing military attorneys. The rest uh, were civil servants. And uh, some of those civil servants had, built, had a military background that made them competitive. Uh, many did, and they practice across a very wide spectrum. We had fiscal law experts, environmental law experts, administrative law uh, experts. We, did, we had a robust ethics practice, international law experts, intelligence law experts, etc. So across this in, a huge legal domain of uh, uh, personnel, uh, it, it is kind of uh, dependent upon the environment that you find yourself. Right now, government is constricting. Okay, so that's what's going on. Uh, five years ago, there were, if you went on a, a website called uh, Jobs USA or USA Jobs, you'd see a gazillion jobs that, you know, out there uh, for government attorneys. Uh, you could kind of pick uh, what flavor of law you wanted to get into and if you had, if you had uh, gone to, to law school and taken a lot of those courses, making even better, if you had some, a little experience, you'd be competitive uh, for those positions. Even without experience, though, you would be competitive. In today's environment, there are still jobs out there. In fact, I, I looked uh, about a month ago just to see what was out there. The constellation of jobs is, is mostly in orbit around the uh, national capital region, uh, but there are a lot of jobs still out there. Uh, when I hired attorneys, I like people who had, had maybe it's just a bias I have, but I, I usually look for people who had a tour in uniform doing something because I knew that there would be a discipline, uh, that they had achieved success, you know, et cetera. And, and I could look at their uh, evaluation reports. And that, again, that's a, kind of a personal bias, but also on uh, a couple of occasions, hired people right out of law school based on recommendations, based on transcripts and stuff, stuff like that, too, so. Others? Yes, Mr. Whitaker, uh, can you talk a little bit more about intelligence law? I guess um, some of the central challenges may be based on, on both the special operations and the conventional side, and I guess what, what was sort of the governing legal authority that you'd have to interpret or, or use this for your... Well, I would defer a little bit to, to the gentleman on my right for two reasons. Most importantly, in 1975 when we began, I wasn't even born yet. Uh, the second reason. That's an actual, that's a great question for, for SOCOM. Because if, if you look at the, the, the complex of, of, of intelligence law, the, most people think about intelligence oversight law. They don't, you know, there's really two dimensions of intelligence law. It's that body of law that authorizes intelligence activities, and then the body of law that, that provides oversight and restrictions in regard to intelligence activities. Okay, and and I think George and I share that piece, but there is a there is a wider um, complex of, of intelligence related laws and, and what the. What's happened in the last decade is that the Department of Defense has said, look, you know, we play in the intelligence activities in arena. We have intelligence organizations. In fact, uh, I have a he was the director of Naval Intelligence, which is one of the, of the big intelligence organizations within uh, that constellation. Uh, SOCOM, however, and in fact, the Department of Defense says, look, there's, there's also military operations. Since uh, the French and Indian War, 
would like to say. Uh, we have been conducting uh, military operations that are focused on gathering information about the enemy from the tactical, operational, and strategic level. Uh, so, in, in, in George's language, national intelligence. Now, SOCOM generally says, you know, we don't do that. We have we have a an organization that does national intelligence. They call this intelligence agency. So what we're focused on is operational intelligence, tactical, and one step above that, operational. And we do that under the uh, under the authority of of Title Ten, you know, United States Code. We're, we're authorized to conduct military operations, and, and the gathering of intelligence in support of the military operation is just a military another military operation. And we and we can find you know our authority, which really starts with with Article Two of the Constitution, and I can I can trace it all the way to down to the battlefield show you that so that's so those are the two big dimensions and one entirely consistent share with the brother on my right and the rest and the other section is entirely independent section. yeah let, let me just add one thing to that another way of looking at it although it's basically the same thing I've always thought that the way we broke down our work at CIA was there was one category whether you call it policy intelligence policy, intelligence law policy, it really got at the basic question of may I do it? It's constitution, it's big picture statutory, it's electronic surveillance, FISA. Uh, then there's a second category, which is really more the operational, well, how do you do it? And there's a lot of administrative, there's contracts, there's, there's the, the details and intricacies where each agency may have its own authorities. And the third category, which includes oversight, is cleanup. Uh, when things go wrong, how do you deal with it? It's, it's the legislative side, uh, it's the investigatory side, it's dealing with issues in court, but it's, it's pretty much the same. As, uh, which is we have time for one more question. Gentlemen, you can stand around for informal conversation for a few minutes down here. Please join me in thanking 